We're going to open this morning's service with, um, we always want to sing this when Joy comes, because we both love this hymn, and, uh, and it's a treat for her to come and play piano for us. So hopefully she'll, bring, uh, she'll come back with Delphus in July, so we'll see her again there. Anyway, let's all stand together. We'll sing hymn number 21 from your spiral hymn book, number 21, The Covenant Ordered and Sure. <coughs> you. <clears throat> a covenant is a promise. And uh, man re man's religion is based on his promise to God. And the gospel is God's promise to God. The Lord Jesus Christ promised to do all that God required for his elect to be saved. And that was in the covenant of grace before Adam was ever made. Oh, what hope. <laughs> it is in, that's why the scripture says it is impossible for our God to lie. <clears throat> We're going to be in the book of Mark this morning again, Mark chapter 8. <clears throat> and uh, while, you, while you turn there, remind you that... Uh, uh, Fred and Mary Jane are headed back to Chicago uh, this week, so we won't see them for a few months. We love you guys, and we're going to miss you. Um, um, Max and Katie Hansen have been listening to our services online for years now, and I've been had the privilege of corresponding with them. They live in, 
in Texas. And uh, they're here this morning, so we're happy that you all are here. Um, <clears throat> I don't know whether to announce. I'll wait till the second hour to uh, make some comments about the Lord's table. We're going to celebrate the Lord's table this morning, but we'll wait. Okay. All right. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Our merciful Heavenly Father, we would not dare approach you except to come in the name of thy dear Son, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We're so thankful that thy throne is a throne of grace and that we have the hope of knowing that that he truly is our surety, as we've just sung, that he has accomplished everything that you require for the salvation of your people. Lord, we confess to you that we are unable to be discerning about anything spiritual. Lord, we're so fleshly and so bound to this physical world we completely depend upon you for your Holy Spirit to open the eyes of our understanding, to cause us to set our affections on things above where Christ is seated at thy right hand. Lord, we're dependent upon you to turn us from our fleshly ways and cause us, Lord, to have our hope and our faith in thy son. We pray, Lord, that you would open the mystery of the gospel to our hearts and reveal to us the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ and give to us hope. For it's in his name we ask it. Amen. <clears throat> Let me read this, uh, this text first before I introduce it. Mark chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. In those days, the multitude being very great and having nothing to eat, Jesus calling his disciples unto him and said unto them. <clears throat> there was a multitude of people that were hungry. Oh, that's our hope this morning, isn't it? If we're hungry, spiritually hungry, that's a work of grace. The Lord's going to have to cause that. We, we won't be hungry by ourselves. No man seeketh after God at any time. We're just way too fleshly to have any interest in spiritual things. So the Lord has to create in us a hunger for himself. I have compassion on the multitude, verse 2, because they have now been with me three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away fasting to their own houses... They will faint by the way, for divers of them came from far. And his disciples answered him, From whence can a man satisfy these men with bread here in the wilderness? <laughs> oh, our souls can never be satisfied by bread in this wilderness in which we live. The Lord's going to have to do a miracle. He's going to have to make something out of nothing in order to satisfy the thirst of our hearts. And he asked them, how many loaves have ye? And they said, seven. And he commanded the people to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves and gave them, and break and gave to his disciples to set before them, and they did set them before the people. And they had a few small fishes, and he blessed and commanded to set them also before them. So they did eat and were filled. <laughs> oh, that I hope this morning. The Lord will cause us to see the wilderness that we live in and uh, create in us a hunger for himself and then fill us with the bread of life. The Lord Jesus Christ is that bread of life. He said, Moses did not give you that bread that fell from heaven in the wilderness, my father gave it to you. And then he went on to say, I am the bread of life. 
I am the bread of life. If any man hunger, let him come unto me. <clears throat> so they did eat and were filled, and they took up the broken meat that was left, seven baskets. And they that had eaten were about 4,000, and he sent them away. Now this multitude of people had been with the Lord for three days. They were far away from their homes. They were in a place where there was no food. And, uh, and, and they didn't even, they, they didn't take notice of the fact that they weren't going to be able to provide for themselves. <laughs> and now the Lord has compassion on them. And he turns to the disciples and says, what are we going to do for them? How are we going to feed them? And, uh, and then he did a work of grace in creating bread out of just a few loaves and, and, and a few fishes. This is a gospel story, isn't it? Um, I, I've, I've titled this message, There's Only One Safe Place. There's only one safe place to be. How important is safety to you? <laughs> How important is it? Um, if you've got a, a business or work in a business where people could be possibly injured, I know what's on the wall in your business. Big signs that say what? Safety first. <laughs> That's pretty important, isn't it? Somebody gets injured, it's going to mess up everything, isn't it? Safety first. You know, I was thinking that uh, how much money we spend every year to, uh, uh, to safeguard our existence as far as the national budget is concerned. And I thought about the TSA and the FDA and the CDC, and those are all designed. But then I realized, you know what? The $4 trillion that we spend a year, every bit of it, really, every bit of it, the military budget, the safety nets of the entitlements, <laughs> all $4 trillion that we spend every year is really designed to provide for us safety. That's what it's about. How important is safety to you? Uh, last week, the fire, fire marshal came here and checked all of our exit lights and checked our fire extinguishers, and he has the authority to shut us down and lock these doors if, if, if this building wasn't safe. <laughs> uh, it's an important part of our lives, isn't it? Um, I could ask the women in our congregation here, what is the most important thing to you uh, in your relationship with your husband? What do you need most from him? And I hear a woman thinking, well, I wish he'd listened to me better. <laughs> and we ought to. We ought to. We, we're not real good at that sometimes, but I'll tell you the one thing that's most important to a woman with her, with her man is to feel safe, to feel safe. Everything else can be worked on, <laughs> but if a woman doesn't feel safe, uh, that's, that's not going to work, is it? Not going to work. Um, safety, how important, how important is it? We spend a lot of time and a lot of treasure trying to secure for ourselves safety. And yet with all these safety nets, there are no absolute guarantees in this life that we'll be safe. Things happen, don't they? Things happen. Is there any place, is there any place that's guaranteed to be perfectly safe all the time? All the time. Now, these people had reason to be concerned, but in fact, they were safe. <laughs> they were safe. Why? Because there's only one safe place to be. Only one safe place to be. And that's to be in Christ. To be found in him. Not having any righteousness of our own, which is by the law, but that righteousness which is by the faithfulness of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the only safe place to be. All the time and all the energy and all the effort 
that we, that, we, that we put into trying to create for ourselves a safe environment, there's only one place that's truly safe. Listen to what God says in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 10. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth to it and is safe. <laughs> the righteous run to Christ and uh, they are safe. The fear of man bringeth a snare. But whosoever putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe shall be safe Paul said in Philippians chapter 3 <clears throat> sometimes we gospel preachers get accused of just beating the same drum and uh, the same sound all the time and uh, and they 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 hurl those accusations at us sometimes thinking that they're uh, that they're going to shame us but they don't realize that they're actually um, complimenting us <laughs> and here's what Paul said in Philippians chapter 3 finally brethren rejoice in the Lord for to write the same thing to you to me is not grievous but to you it is safe <laughs> it is safe preaching the same message lifting the same Christ it's the only place of safety that there is and then in Psalm chapter 4, verse 7, the scripture says, Thou hast put gladness in my heart more than the time when their corn and wine increaseth. Lord, you've put, you've put a gladness in my heart that exceeds the gladness that the unbeliever experiences when they're prosperous. I will both lay me down in peace and sleep. For, Lord, thou only, thou only hast made me safe. <clears throat> when we close our eyes in death and we take that final breath, and it is appointed unto man once to die, there's a, there's a specific moment in time for each one of us to meet God. How are we going to stand in the presence of a holy God and be safe? Be safe. These people needed a safety net, didn't they? <laughs> they needed someone to provide for them uh, what they could not provide for themselves. They were hungry, and the Lord performed a miracle and fed them. Man by nature is not satisfied. He's not satisfied with the safety net that God has provided in Christ. He's always looking for something else. Turn to me to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 12. 1 Samuel chapter 12. <clears throat> Samuel was the last of the judges. And the children of Israel came to Samuel and said, we want to be like the other nations that are around us. We want to have a king. We don't feel safe. We need a figurehead to, to look to for our safety. And the Lord said to Samuel, he said, go tell them that I'm their king. <laughs> and they continued to insist that they wanted a physical king. They wanted a, a man set on a throne that they could look at to secure their safety. And so the Lord said, okay, I'll give you what you want. And we know the rest of that story, don't we? The Lord gave them Saul, worst king. Uh, I mean, the, the things that happened in Israel as a result of, of Saul's leadership, um, Here's the, here's the verse I want you to see. Look at uh, verse 11 in 1 Samuel chapter 12. And the Lord sent Jerubbabel. That's uh, another name for Samuel. 
uh, I'm sorry, Jerubbabel is another name for Gideon, and uh, Bedan and Japhthah and Samuel and delivered you out of the hand of your enemies on every side and you dwelled safe. God's saying to his people, I gave you, those were all, all those names that we just read were names of judges. And, and the Lord's saying, I provided you for these ju- with these judges to tell you the truth about who I am. I was your king, and you dwelled safely. I provided for you, but you weren't satisfied. You had to have something more. The only hope that we have of being truly safe is to be found in him. To be able to know that when we stand in the presence of a holy God, we have a righteous advocate who stands in our stead and presents himself on our behalf. Men want to to pretend that they're safe when they're not safe. 2 Thessalonians chapter 5, the scripture says, And when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction shall come upon them, and they shall not be delivered. Now what does the false prophet say? The false prophet says peace, peace, when there is no peace. The false prophet says just do your best and God will be satisfied. The false prophet says, you know, you just uh, you used to be a good person. Uh, make a decision. Uh, God will God will allow you into His presence, peace and safety, and then sudden destruction shall come upon them. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter thirty-three. There is only one safe place to be. (laughs) Only one safe place. Deuteronomy chapter 33, look look with me at verse 27. Well, we begin at verse 26. There is none like unto the God of Jeshurun, who rideth upon the heaven in thy help, and in his excellency, On the sky, the eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms, and he shall thrust out the enemy from before thee, and shall say, destroy them. Israel then shall dwell in safety alone. (laughs) Now who is our enemy? Who is our enemy? Well, as I've said many times before, your enemy's sitting in the same seat you're sitting in, isn't he? We really are our own worst enemies. And our sin nature, our flesh, is so bound to this world. And the Lord says, I'm going to cast out your enemy. I'm putting an end to sin. <laughs> I'm going I'm to satisfy the demands of God's justice for your sin. I'm going to present myself on your behalf for all your righteousness. I'm going to fulfill the requirements of the law. I'm going to cast out the enemy. Cast him out. And I'm going to deliver you so that sin shall no longer have dominion over you. You say, well, how do I know when sin had dominion over me? When sin had dominion over you, it was impossible for you to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You were blinded by that sin. You were dead in that sin. You were unable to hear the voice of God because of sin. (laughs) And the Lord said, you shall no longer be under the dominion of sin. I'm going to break those chains and I'm going to set you free and I'm going to enable you to believe on me. And so the Lord says here, I'm I'm gonna cast out your enemy and uh, you shall be, you shall live in safety alone. Look at verse 28. 
The fountain of Jacob shall be upon a land of corn and wine. Also his heavens shall drop down dew. Now here's the promise of God to open the windows of heaven and drop down into our hearts the Lord Jesus Christ. To speak to our hearts the truth about him. To reveal to us his glory. How did Isaiah say it? Oh God, rend the heavens and come down. And what did John say in Revelation when the Lord revealed himself? He said that the heavens were opened and I saw him sitting upon his throne. And what did Isaiah say when he went to the temple that day? I saw the Lord high and lifted up <laughs> and his train filled the temple. The seraphims hovered over him and cried, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. Here's the promise that God's making in Deuteronomy. I'm going to open the windows of heaven and the dew of my grace is going to come down. Verse 29, Happy art thou, O Israel, who is like unto thee, O people, saved by the Lord, the shield of thy help, and who is the sword of thy excellency? And thine enemies shall be found liars unto thee, and thou shalt tread upon their high places. Now who is the liar? Well, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 says, Because they had no love for the truth. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So because men by nature have no love for Christ... God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe the lie. What is the lie? The lie is that I can earn favor with God by something I do, a decision I make, a choice that I'm able to exercise, a work that I perform. That's the lie. The lie is that man has set himself up on the throne of God. And now the Lord is saying to his people here in, um, in, in Deuteronomy chapter 33, you're going to find them to be liars and thou shalt tread upon their high places. <laughs> You'll discern the truth about how unable you are to get to heaven. You're unable to do it. If we're going to meet God, he's going to have to come to us, isn't he? <laughs> There's just absolutely no way we can get to him. You know that's what Babylon's all about, isn't it? That's what the Tower of Babel was all about. And that's, and that's man-made religion. It's just Babylon talk, isn't it? Just babble, babble, babble. <laughs> Remember last Sunday we saw that man who had an impediment of speech? And the Lord loosed his tongue. He spit and touched his tongue and loosed his tongue. You know how you can tell if a person's got an impediment of speech when it comes to spiritual things? Here's how they talk. I, 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 I. I made a decision. I did this. I came to Christ. I invited Jesus into my heart. God says, I'm going to expose those liars to you and you're going to be safe because you're not going to be trusting yourself for your salvation. You're going to be looking to the one who did it all and he did it all by himself. Oh, what safety there is. Turn with me to the book of Job. Right before Psalms. Job chapter 5. Verse 7. Now remember, if you ask the President of the United States what is the most important part of your job, what's the, what's the, what's the primary objective of your job, I'll tell you what he'll tell you. To keep Americans safe. And the entire $4 trillion that we spend every year is to try to avert trouble and keep us safe, isn't it? And yet there is no permanent 
true, sure safety in all of that, in all of that. Look what God says in Job chapter 5 at verse 7. Yet man is born unto trouble. As the sparks fly upward, I would seek unto God, and unto God would I commit my cause, which doeth great things and unsearchable, marvelous things without number, who giveth rain upon the earth and sendeth water upon the fields to set up on high those that be low and that those which mourn shall be exalted to safety. (laughs) To safety. Blessed are they who are poor of spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they which mourn. Now you say, well, if I can just, if I can just develop a, a poor spirit, then God will bless me. No, the poor spirit is God's blessing. <laughs> if I can just mourn enough, then God will bless me. No, being able to mourn over your sin is the blessing. That is the blessing. That's the work of grace in the heart. And that's what the Lord's saying here. He said, those that mourn may be exalted, exalted to safety. He disappointeth the devices of the crafty so that their hands cannot perform their enterprise. He taketh the wise in their own craftiness and the counsel of the forward in, uh, is carried headlong. They meet with darkness in the daytime and grope in the noonday as in the night. But he saveth the poor from the sword. What is the sword that you and I need to be saved from? It's the wrath of God's justice. That's the sword we have to be saved from. What happened on Calvary's cross? God sheathed the sword of his justice in the heart of his own son. That's what he did. And the Lord Jesus Christ became our, as the scripture says, propitiation. That means God's been made propitious. There's no more wrath. There's no more fear of God's justice for those for whom Christ died. But he saves the poor, verse 15, from the sword, from their mouth and from the hand of the mighty. So the poor hath hope and iniquity. Stoppeth her mouth. (laughs) Does your iniquity stop your mouth before God? Scripture says when the law comes, God gave the law in order to shut the mouths of men. That's what he came to do. That's what the law does. It shuts our mouths. It causes us to realize we've never ever one single time been able to satisfy one of the demands of God's holy law. Let let those who believe the lie present themselves before God based on something they've done, based on a decision they've made, a prayer they prayed, a work that they performed. Our mouths are shut by the law of God and we realize that everything we've ever done is iniquitous. In the sight of a holy God. We just. What is iniquity? Iniquity. It's our. It's that which is not equal. That's what iniquity means. (laughs) Not equal. What do you have. In your life. Produced by you. That's equal. To the holiness of God. God says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. What in your life measures up to God's glory? You see everything about us. It's amazing. Well, here's a miracle of grace. If we ever see ourselves to be sinners, that's God's work of grace in the heart. Because most folks don't believe themselves to be sinners. Oh, they believe themselves to have some sin. I've done some things that 
You know, sin is just a behavioral problem. I've got this and that that I need to be forgiven for. But to understand that sin is what we are, we do what we do because we are what we are. We commit sins because we're sinners. We're not sinners because we commit sins. Let me say it again. We commit sins because we're sinners. We don't become sinners because we commit sins. A huge difference. Huge difference. Are you safe? <laughs> we spend a lot of time and treasure trying to secure our safety, don't we? Safety is very important to us. How important is the safety of your soul in the presence of a holy God? These people were safe because though they were hungry, the disciples could find nothing for them in the wilderness. The Lord Jesus Christ performed a miracle and created something out of nothing. And that's what he does when he saves a sinner. He creates something out of nothing, doesn't he? <laughs> the Pharisees, what'd they say? We'd be children of Abraham. What'd the Lord Jesus Christ say to them? God can raise up children of Abraham from those stones there on the ground. And that's exactly what he does, doesn't he? Every child of Abraham, every child of God, was raised up from a stone. A lifeless, cold, hard stone was given life. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're, we're so very thankful that there is safety in Christ. And oh, how hopeful we are that you would cause us to flee to him, our high tower, our righteousness, and all our justification before thee, and be found safe. For it's in his name we pray.